So good morning. Good morning to everyone. Um, congratulations to all of you who battled the snow to uh, arrive at uh, this conference. And um, uh, although I would say, uh, as a resident normally of Boston, Massachusetts, where my family is now digging out from one and a half meters of snow, we've seen nothing here <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> So I'm glad that that hasn't happened here in Budapest. Um, I cannot imagine a more uh, important and uh, interesting and far-reaching conference at CEU uh, than the future of Europe and the European Union, which is the subject of today's conference. Um, CEU is very proud to have four distinct identities, European, American, Hungarian, and global. And we have nearly 2,000 students and faculty from across Europe and around the world from 110 countries, all continents. And in this uniquely international environment, we pride ourselves on promoting free and open exchange of ideas and opinions about difficult and compelling and far-reaching subjects like the future of the European Union. CEU is, is very honored to host uh, today's conference as an expression of this open dialogue. And we have a very wide range of speakers who have been invited, including several who, for scheduling reasons, are unable to attend. We have many distinguished participants, including prestigious scholars, civil society leaders, European and national decision makers, and above all, our two keynote speakers, Foreign Minister Karl Schwarzenberg of the Czech Republic and Foreign Minister, former Foreign Minister Joschka Fischer of Germany, whom I will introduce in a moment. But first, let me make a few uh, opening and introductory comments. What can an American rector of a global European Hungarian university uh, say about the future of Europe in introducing this conference. First, uh, I think it's important for me to pay tribute to the European le leaders, many European leaders, who have forged a vision of a unified Europe, difficult to achieve, extremely complex, and right now greatly challenged. But it's a vision that was formed out of the horrors of two world wars that originated in the violent nationalism and racism of a fractured Europe. It's also out of the deep divisions of a Cold War that isolated Central and Eastern Europeans and prevented them for nearly half a century for, from achieving self-determination, from achieving political freedom, and from achieving economic prosperity. I want to pay tribute not just to the original leaders like Jean Monnet and others who had this vision, but to the leaders across Europe today and over the last 50 years. Perhaps, indeed, we should dedicate this conference to them. The second point I want to make is that this vision of a more unified Europe is based on a set of values that are also the values we try to live up to here at CEU. Basic values, the value of diversity, of tolerance, of democracy, human rights, and open society. These are the values that make it possible for us here at CEU to live in a densely international community where there are literally hundreds of different nationalities and cultures represented among us. My third introductory point is about the challenges now facing this vision of a strong Europe and the values it is intended to promote. The financial and economic crisis has exposed weaknesses in the structure of the, U the EU. It has also created tensions among the member states and dangers that a multi-speed Europe divided between debtors and creditors, between Euro and non-Eurozone members will begin to emerge. In this environment, how will the EU budget take shape and what benefits will it bring to the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, such as Hungary? What changes are needed in European economic governance to promote economic stabilization? And what should be done to create more democratic legitimacy and accountability in the EU to support 
greater economic integration? These are huge questions, and today's conference will address them, although I can be sure, and so can you, that there will be as many answers as there are speakers on the program. I want to thank my colleague Peter Ballas and the Center for EU Enlargement Studies for organizing this conference along with their co-sponsors, the European Commission, the Hungarian Institute of International Affairs, and the Patriotism and Progress Foundation represented by uh, Gordon Boynoy here on stage. Our keynote speakers are two of Europe's most distinguished statesmen. It's an honor to welcome Joschka Fischer and Karl Schwarzenberg to CEU. Joschka Fischer is the former vice chancellor and second longest serving foreign minister of the Federal Republic of Germany. He's led the Green Party to their first party at participation in government, both at the state and the federal level. He's a champion of European integration and the architect of Germany's uh, more active role in global affairs. I first met him in 1998 when he was helping forge Europe's position on the human rights crisis in Kosovo, and I was the Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights in the U.S. Since stepping down as Foreign Minister in 2005, he has held a professorship at the Woodrow Wilson School of Government at Princeton, <coughs> served on many international boards, is a member of the European Council on Foreign Relations, and is a founding partner of his own consulting group, Joschka Fischer and Company. One little known biographical detail that ties Joschka Fischer to Hungary is that his family fled Soviet occupation of Hungary in 1946, two years before his birth. Karl Schwarzenberg is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic, a position he has held since 2007. He's had a long and distinguished leadership role in his country, in Europe, and in the world. He was a leading voice in the democratic transformation of Czechoslovakia and a close associate of Václav Havel both before and after 1989. He was counselor to President Havel from 1990 to 92. And I first met Minister Schwarzenberg in 1999 when he kindly gave me his perspective on Czech political affairs and taught me much of what I know about Czech history and culture when I was serving as the U.S. Ambassador to the Czech Republic. Before becoming Foreign Minister, <coughs> he was a member of the Senate of the Czech Republic, a member of the Committee on EU Affairs, and Chairman of the Committee on Foreign Defense and Security. Our keynote speakers will each speak for about 20 minutes, and then we will take a few questions. So, Please join me in welcoming Ministers Joschka Fischer and Karl Schwarzenberg to CEU. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here, as always, uh, in Budapest. Uh, you mentioned my personal connections. Unfortunately, I don't speak Hungarian. My mother, uh, both parents were completely bilingual, uh, didn't learn it to me. I missed the opportunity to ask her before she died why, so I can't give an explanation um, uh, for that fact. But, uh, of course, there is always uh, a close, also emotional relationship to Hungary. <coughs> Uh, based on uh, the, my biography. Nowadays, we will speak about Europe. And uh, let me start with uh, um, a remark about uh, the negotiations, the successful negotiations, uh, about the uh, seven years budget of the EU, where when I follow the British press, uh, the big winner is the United Kingdom. So. Mr. Cameron falsified himself, <laughs> because it's no, it makes no sense to fight against Europe when you dominate Europe. And that's exactly what I read in the British press. But that's uh, only a remark. When we talk about Europe, uh, let me start with uh, history, because you can't understand the European project, and you can't understand Europe without history. We are the continent of history. America is the continent of the market. 
we are the continent of history. <laughs> and uh, and uh, some of the rationalities or irrationalities of Europe, um, it's hard to understand without uh, uh, history. When we go back 100 years, 1930, there was still a very different world. It was the year before the First World War, the big catastrophe was looming, especially in that region in the Balkans. The two Balkan wars uh, had happened or uh, were in uh, the midst of the second Balkan wars. And then in 1914, the world changed. And uh, I'm pretty sure if you would ask the decision makers of 1914 whether they would have done or made their decisions in the same way, knowing what would happen in the war and after the war, I think none of them would have uh, confirmed uh, his or her, mostly his, decisions. So from that point of view, it's the European catastrophe. And it was the explosion of a European system which started centuries earlier as a result of the, before the Second World War, most devastating war in my country, in Germany, the Thirty Years' War. And at the end of the Thirty Years' War, a new European system was created based on sovereign states. Sovereignty was uh, the new concept. And uh, the centralization of power with sovereign states and sovereign rulers. The system was based on the balance of power. It was based on rivalry of sovereign states. And this worked pretty well if you are not looking for the wars to balance that system, that rivalry, until the French Revolution and the English Revolution called the Industrial Revolution took place. The Industrial Revolution and the French Revolution changed the whole system and it exploded at the end in the First World War. And the First World War was not the beginning of a, a, a war which uh, lasted for a few years with the devastating costs of human lives on both sides, but it was the beginning of an almost century-long war in Europe. We shouldn't forget that. It started in 1914, but it didn't end in 1945. It ended not even in 1989, if you are looking to the Balkan Wars. It ended at the end of the Kosovo War between the West and Serbia. So it's almost a century, a short, very short century, but it's almost a hundred years war, which uh, turned Europe upside down. And the consequence of this war let, it will lead us immediately into the present situation. Because it was the beginning of the decline of Europe, of all of us, in which country we are living. And nowadays we see the consequences. And we shouldn't forget that when we talk about the future of Europe, that there is a de-Westernization of uh, the global reality. There is a shift of power and wealth from West to East. Decolonization started earlier, but now old new powers are rising again. And when we talk about the future of Europe, ladies and gentlemen, we can't deny the change on the global stage. It's not any longer about avoid wars in Europe. This is a very noble and very important cause and continues to be a very important cause. But even more important are the global challenges. And if the Europeans think we can continue in our 19th century um, uh, way of thinking, in our uh, uh, kind of uh, old-fashioned 19th century nationalism, I think we would, we would hurt our interests. It's not about uh, Hungary or Czechia or Germany or France or Poland. It's about Europe in this globalized world. So from that point of view, I think history is very important for the explanation of the present challenges and the future reality. 
And allow me to add one more uh, element uh, for the future. Uh, we all are used to be um, living in, uh, um, uh, in, in, under the protection of our American cousins. America is changing. America is adapting to the new world reality. America will not disengage from Europe. It will not disengage from the Middle East, from our neighborhood. But it will, it will uh, change its priorities. It will be in the future more Pacific than transatlantic. It will be continue to, trans to be transatlantic. But America has also serious problems at home and uh, is in a relative decline together with us. I mean the West. I give you an example where you can measure that. After 1945, America defined the rules of the global financial system. Now, after 2008, America does not have the capability to define the rules. Does China have that? I doubt. Russia? No. Other powers? No. So the question for the present crisis will be, there won't be a new order defined by one power. It's a more, from my analysis, based on my analysis, a more chaotic development. So I don't see a, a short-term crisis, uh, to be honest. From that point of view, the Europeans have to ask themselves whether we are prepared for a stronger role in defining our interests. And these are not only economic interests. These are also political interests and the question of values. I think it's very important, if you look back in history, that Europe nowadays, with all the criticisms and all the shortcomings, we have a common set of values. Rule of law, democracy, a kind of welfare state. So from that point of view, I think uh, um, we experienced tremendous progress at the end of these short hundred years of war in Europe. If we look to the present situation, we have to be very grateful about the EU integration process. The EU is not only a pragmatic issue. It's not only an economic or financial issue. It's also a new political system. We started with a system of rivalry and balance of power. And this is still in many European minds. On the other hand, we developed a system where rivalry changed to integration, where nationalism was changed to a common European set of values and also political and economic solidarity. As weak and as questionable all these issues are, especially in the crisis, they are there. They are a given. Think about what would have happened without enlargement, or say only a small enlargement. Czechia would be part of that, uh, Poland, uh, question mark, at that time. Not today. Hungary would have been on the sunny side. But think about the situation, what would have happened with the re-emergence uh, re uh, of Russian power without the big enlargement round. I know the criticism about that, but think about the alternative. So I'm personally pretty happy that we made the enlargement, big enlargement. But this, of course, uh, created more uh, instable and created uh, um, um, a Europe which has to deal with uh, additional challenges. Now, to the present situation of the EU. We were hit by the financial crisis very severely, right in the middle of the river. We were moving towards uh, a closer union, but we didn't reach it. And the real cause for the financial crisis here in Europe, for the European financial crisis, is not a financial issue, it's a political issue. 
America, Japan, China, everybody shares the same financial uh, distresses as uh, uh, we are sharing this. But only Europe has a political problem. Nobody is questioning whether China or the US will survive. But there is a question whether the European Union will survive, because we don't have a firm political framework. That's the real problem. We are stuck in a situation as the US did it more than two centuries ago. They started after the War of Independence as a confederation. And they almost collapsed. And thanks to Alexander Hamilton and some other really um, impressive founding fathers, they managed it to move forward and to overcome these problems um, into a, a federation. But the real founding of the United States was done during the Lincoln period in the Civil War. They are called now um, uh, a union, or the, this was the founding of uh, the union of the United States, was the second founding. What we lack is the strong political framework for um, our confederation. So the step from confederation to federation is exactly what we have to do if we want to overcome the crisis. I don't see that the present situation is a stable and sustainable one. And there is a problem. Because not all European member states are part of the currency union. Now, the currency union is not Europe. But the failure of the currency union will destroy Europe. So it's more a negative consequence. And from that point of view, survival of the currency union will need a stronger political framework, means transfer of national sovereignty in the economic and financial sector to I wouldn't say Brussels, but to the European level, because uh, the present institutions are also hit by that crisis. And we made tremendous progress in that direction. It's not that Joschka Fischer had some imaginations, now explaining to you. Um, it's about analyzing what happened since 2009. And since 2009, when the crisis hit Europe, we have a tremendous progress in this direction. Are there any longer in the Eurogroup, and allow me to speak now about only the Eurogroup, are there any uh, national initiatives in the way we can do it alone? Even the Brits outside of uh, the Eurozone have tremendous problems to define it on a national level without taking into account um, uh, uh, the Eurozone and the Eurogroup and the steps uh, which are made in the Eurozone. So from that point of view, there is a split driven by the crisis. This split existed before, but was not so relevant. But nowadays, it's very relevant. And it will continue to be more relevant. The Eurozone must go ahead. It's not because I like it. It's because these are the consequences to overcome the crisis. If you want to sustain the euro, then you have to move into political integration. Cameron is right in that point. And this will mean not a multi-speed Europe. It will mean, mean de facto an avant-garde, which will define the pace and the direction, and a rear guard, which will follow or not. That's the reality, not because I like it, but that's the reality as I see it. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I think we are uh, moving ahead in a more political integrated Europe. Now, let me turn to the traditional federalist concept. I think I include myself as a federalist. We federalists made a big mistake in the past. We underestimated the role of the nations. Europe is defined by its diversity and will continue to be defined by its diversity. Um, Hungarians will continue to be Hungarians, and Slovaks will continue to be Slovaks. Do we have um, to overcome our national identities? Clear answer, no. Can we then integrate? Clear answer, yes. Is there an example? Yes. Switzerland. I have close friends in Switzerland, on the French and on the German side. My question always is, are you closer uh, over the centuries? 
Do you become closer? No. Culturally, no. But it works because they were able to preserve their national identities in a new political framework called Switzerland. They have common institutions. They have shared sovereignty. But they preserve their national identity. So from that point of view, what I can read in analyzing uh, the present situation, and especially since 2009, from my point of view, it's we won't have an elected president as the US. How can that happen? A European president candidate campaigning in Hungary. Wow. He's not speaking only to the intellectuals who can speak uh, uh, foreign languages. He must speak to the people. How can he with a translator? That's a funny experience, I suppose. And the same in all the other uh, European countries. It's not going to happen. From my point of view, we have to rethink that we are moving more on uh, the basis of uh, the existing structures and the role of the nations and the nation states. So it's more the Swiss model, not one to one. Do not misinterpret my words. But it's more the Swiss model to find together. And that's exactly what happens in the present situation. We have de facto a European financial and economic government. It's called the heads of states and government uh, of the Eurozone. It's not exclusive, it's inclusive. Whoever wants to join has the right and is able to join and has a say. So from that point of view, I think we can see the evolving structure. There is one big issue. Europe was a technocratic project or an elite project in the past, and still is. But there is a serious stress nowadays between the technocratic approach, what defines the reality, and the democratic approach. Now, I'm not uh, frightened about the debate about Europe, that everybody seems to hate Europe or whatever. It's good. I would be very concerned if there wouldn't be emotions. But uh, as long as a couple is shouting against each other, there is still hope. <laughs> Once they are not talking any longer to each other, it's a lost cause. So nowadays, everybody, everywhere, including my own country, is debating Europe. I think that's a very good uh, signal. Secondly, we have to transform uh, the technocratic project in a democratic one. We have common values. It's working. Not perfect, but it's working. What we need now is to integrate also the democratic factor, and these are the national parliaments. From my point of view, what we can learn in this crisis is that the, the national parliaments need a European role. It makes no sense that the Greeks are shouting about the Germans in the Greek parliament, or the Germans are shouting about the Greeks in the Germans. They should do it together. They should learn from each other. And therefore, I'm strongly in favor of a Euro chamber based on representatives of the national parliaments to sit together, to decide together, not in the first step, in the first step start to discuss together, but in the second step, I think it's unavoidable that we need this democratic element. And it must be the national parliaments because the budgetarian sovereignty is uh, in the hands of the national parliaments and not of the European parliament. Is that directed against the uh, uh, European parliament? No. One day it will be a, second, uh, a, a, a two chamber structure. The European parliament together with representatives of the national parliaments as the second chamber it would also solve the problems with the council. The council would be driven in the direction of government and losing its uh, um, lawmaking uh, uh, prerogatives. So from that point of view, what I can see from emerging from the crisis is a new structure. It will need time. It will be an interesting decade ahead of us. But once again, ladies and gentlemen, it's about our common future from a Chinese or Indian or Brazilian or American point of view, it makes no difference. From far away, we are all the same. 
Europeans. The question is whether we are clever Europeans and defined, define and def, uh, defend our common interests or whether we are, as our American friends call us, the European mess. I would be in favor that we will be clever Europeans for the sake of our children and grandchildren in the 21st century. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for inviting me to this conference. Of course, in these days of crisis, Europe was very much discussed. But I do think if we discuss the European Union, we should first of all acknowledge what it is. The European Union is not an economic project. During its development, it had enormous economic success and brought welfare and wealth to its members. Nevertheless, when Jean Monnet had the first idea planning it in Washington and the fathers of the European unification, beat Robert Schumann, beat Adenauer, beat Alcide de Gasperi or Paul they never we were the first on a sort of an economic arrangement. They spoke about a political project, and that stays the European Union. And that's the first thing. Second, the European Union is not a fixed arrangement as traditional European states, I don't know, Portugal or the Kingdom of Sweden, it's still a work in progress. In these 50 years, I have the pleasure to observe the development of the European Union from the Rome Treaties till today, Lisbon and so on. We see it's a process where always after some years, some occasion or some crisis produces new treaties and a Further reunification. I always think we are, okay. of course, we are getting closer. We are getting closer in an asymptotic way. We will never be something like the United States of America. Of course not, because our states have a thousand years old tradition. They are not, were not designed as, um, say, for the certain coli original colony as of most American states designed on a piece of paper, but they developed in thousand years, have their different nations, different minorities, religions, culture, political culture, and so on and so on. It's a totally different project. So we have to realize that we are getting closer, but more in an asymptotic way. And uh, you know, asymptotic means that you will never see the final point where everything will meet. So that's the way we have to see the European Union. But it is, it is a work in progress, and that's important. And again, it shows this heavy crisis, more economic than anything else, um, proved to develop the European Union further. As Oli Rehn, Commissioner, said, uh, we can't say that we give the patient or the uh, safe sanity bill, but the, we got him out of the phases of intensive care. So that's the situation now. But I'm not, I'm quite optimistic for our future. We will overcome this crisis. Uh, but as Joschka Fischer said, um, to a large degree, still the European Union is a technocratic concept uh, which many intelligent heads, as in Brussels, as in different capitals, think about it. But what we are missing is a vision. A vision and a bit more of enthusiasm. I'm still remembering my younger days, in the 50s and 60s, how all were enchanted by the European Union. 
Now we accept the European Union as a factum, but nobody's enthusiastic about it. And that's a big difference. And we don't have the great vision, what we do we really wish? What do we really want? And of course, that's a difference to the great unification processes of the past. If we look at the reunification or unification of Italy, of Germany, there was a great idea of the nation behind it. And of course, the idea what America should be created not only uh, the ideas of Alexander Hamilton, but of course the civil war which finally created the present United States of a totally different concept. Well, uh, let's hope that we don't need a great civil war in Europe uh, to achieve a further unification. But it is a difficult job, and it won't work if we see it as the only market-projected technocratic project. Cameron was right, asking some questions. He was right when he said that in spite of, I see the importance of, of the European Union, more in the political field, that if we wish a successful European Union, then we have to complete an integrated market in the European Union, which is still didn't happen till now. Some national interests prevailed, and we don't have still a full open integrated market. There he was right. And then, then David Cameron with one thing, right? That he, is that he saw the opening gap between the European institutions and the European citizens. Um, I admit that I love to go in each town where I, I stay uh, to some pub or to some coffee house and discuss with the people there. And of course, it's the same thing if I go in Prague or in Munich or in Vienna, uh, in a coffee house or some other European countries, with few exceptions, you always hear the same complaints about Brussels, they're over-regulating us, they're too distant of us, they have no idea what happens in our country, and so on and so on. And uh, this feeling is going. I do think we have to think re really seriously uh, to how to reunite the European institutions uh, with the European citizens. Because if this distance becomes too great, that would be the real danger for the European Union. I don't see a danger for the European Union for the moment that are from outside. I see a great danger, but it's not the mortal one, it's the stupidness of European politicians. But, of course, when we are not at all interested anymore, we are, we are, we are, if we don't consider the institutions ours, then the European Union will decease quite naturally. So I think we have to think the most important thing for the next 10 years is how to close this gap, how to get the European Union's idea, how to get the European institutions closer to its citizens. So it doesn't consider it as an anonymous foreign power in some Kafka-like Brussels castle. That's, I think, the most important task for the future. And that's our task to certain. If our generation doesn't manage it, then I, I think it, the future is rather sinister. That's one, one thing. Uh, the other thing is that, as I told you, it was founded as a peace project. As after the terrible experience of two world wars in Europe, which practically were European civil wars, uh, the idea of United Europe was created. But of, and therefore, to make it work, it was founded on values to overcome uh, the period of European crimes which we had in 20th century. And I'm very much scared that in quite a lot of countries, 
including my own, in Europe, again, the monsters of the past are raising their heads. Again, there is a big temptation of rather hollow national phrases which brought all our nations in en enormous catastrophes. It was this bland and hollow and senseless nationalism which destroyed great entities in Europe where for centuries or thousand years nation, different nations lived together. For instance, if I'm speaking here in Budapest, uh, the lands of the crowns of, of the holy crown of St. Stephen, which till nationals broke out, lived peacefully together, moment nationals started to work in politics, it fell apart. And uh, let's uh, open, it was a catastrophe, not only for the Hungarians, but several other nations too, what happened in the 20th century. And we should ask ourselves, <coughs> are we responsible if we permit again the rise of this most terrible form of egoism, that is nationalism, where you are egoistic as ever, but you have the excuse that you speak for greater your own notion, and therefore you hide your own selfishness. And, and didn't we see the 20th century, what results it has? I think that's one of the, the most terrible things, which that again, be it here, be it in my country, uh, be it in, in France, and so on, all over Europe, suddenly you hear this, hear this awful voices tempting us again in a dark past. That was the other thing we have to build the, the European Union on the rule of law. That means that we have to obey not only our national laws, that we have to obey the rules with Copenhagen and others, which we set for Europe. And they were developed out of this terrible, terrible experience of the 20th century. If we don't respect the rules, respect our frontiers as existing, we are all again falling back. And uh, of course, there's, in a time of economic crisis, the world over is always the danger and lure of extremism in that and other. Of course, who studied the 20th century and I had the very doubtful pleasure uh, to live through two thirds of the 20th century. And in the end, you see that in the aims and in the means, the so called extreme right and the so called extreme left meet and work perfectly well together. That was, of course, the big temptation of the 20th century when somebody invented that it could be a combination of, now please take these words separately, of national socialism. The combination, which not only is this most famous and most anonymous uh, form, which was in German, the official National so Socialist Party, but let's be honest, it was a formula between the Peronism in Argentine, if you see, or the Basque parties, as in Iraq, as in Syria, behind Nasser's movement in Egypt. Last but not least, it's of a certain form in present China's uh, uh, government and so on. It was the winning idea of the 20th century and brought an enormous and disaster to the whole world. And now it, it begins again popular. We. The nations are first saying, my own nation, and of course, we, the state, will arrange your economy, we will arrange your private life, you will arrange your luck better than if you individual citizens care for it. We are back where we already have been. And let's be very careful about these, new, these ideas, which are not new ideas. They are old ideas just coming back. Uh, so therefore, I do think we have to be more watchful in Europe than we needed to be in the last decades, where still the lesson of the World War II was 
a part of us. Now the world, uh, Second World War is 70 years back, it's forgotten, the lessons are forgotten. Uh, even now people are forgetting uh, the lesson we had uh, through the communist dictatorship in our country. It's now nearly a quarter of a century behind us and we are forgetting even these lessons. Uh, which is which is a dangerous sign uh, because the human race doesn't change. We will still uh, and will be and are staying the same old meat eating malicious monkey we have been in the Stone Age. And we didn't change so much, only our means are better. And one of the most terrible results of the 20th century, and even more in the 21st century. In olden times, if you wished to kill somebody, in the beginning you had to take a stone and yourself throw it in his car or smash it to kill him. Now you can sit in a faraway office, thousands of miles, pressing some buttons before you, uh, and 5,000 miles away somebody is killed. This, of course, gives a much more innocent feeling to the one who kills. He doesn't see either the result of his work, he doesn't see what happened, he doesn't see who suffers under it. He goes back, the exact hour when his office hour finished, go back to a good dinner, and he, he, he didn't realize that he's waging war in his private life. We have to realize that it's an awful temptation, you see? And it's interesting that now we are much more frequently, and it becomes much more accepted than still a generation ago uh, to undertake somewhere an armed action. It becomes, again, a normal part of our political life, which was admittedly for the last, last 100,000 years. Humanity. We had a period in, in where, where Jing War was still uh, a word which you, you didn't like to use, in, you didn't like even to think about it. But now it's again a natural part of thinking. And there came in, and Joschka Fischer was perfectly right to warn us that of course the world has changed and there's a time when Europeans lamentably could rely and the American umbrella is over. Uh, and the Europeans, of course, in the last decades, forgot how to care for themselves. And as always, if you don't care, you lose, because while the only the Americans are able to manage a security situation, we can't it. And of course, we reduce our own uh, part in it from year to year, even in the last 20 years, if you see how much was the use the European uh, part of financing the defense of Europe comparing with the American one, it's a shock if you see the numbers. And of course, as we don't do something in it, we are losing completely any feeling of responsibility for the fate in the world. A normal European citizen, in defense even of the first half of the 20th century, but not to speak 19th century, doesn't feel responsible for anything outside his own small borders. And that's a very dangerous difference. We have to develop the feeling of responsibility, that we are responsible, first of all, of our own quartier, for our own district, for our own country, but for our own Europe, and we are responsible for the world too. A feeling which we completely have lost, and we have to regain it, because I warn you, we will have to do a lot in the next years and decades, because we will be forced to this responsibility. We are not yet prepared to take on our shoulders again. But it, it is a blunt fact that without it, Europe can't survive. Europe can't survive as an isolated, egoistic, 
western part of the Asian continent which doesn't care what in the world is happening. Maybe it doesn't care, and then the world won't care about Europe either, and the results you can imagine yourself. We will end, if we go on like that, neglecting our universities, neglecting our research institutes. Uh, it's, I think in this year, it will be the first time after hundreds of years that the patent balance between Europe and the outside world is turning into a passive one. Europe has to buy, buy more patents from the world. There's only, not only states of Japan, there's already China, India, and so on, and so on. The, and we are becoming... If you go on like that, probably our grandchildren will grow up in a kind of world Venice. That was for Europe now is Venice, a former great power with beautiful buildings, with very good food still sometimes, and a wonderful place for tourism, but lost any importance for world trade and is not anymore power in the Mediterranean or in the world. That will become Europe, a worldwide Venice. We should educate our grandchildren to be good waiters, shoe polishers, working in the hotels for our dear Chinese friends who will come, and Brazilian and Indian who will come to visit Europe. That's if we don't wake up and take care of our, of the things we are responsible ourselves. For the future of Europe, neither the United States, nor the Russian Federation, nor China, or somebody else is responsible, that are we, the Europeans. We are the responsible one. And only if we finally wake up, if we finally realize that the golden time which existed in the many dec decades after World War II, when Europe could develop under the American umbrella, could develop its economy, and admittedly became individually richer than ever, because Nowadays, an average worker in Germany, Austria, and so on, and even in our countries, lives partly much better than even a very, very, very rich man in the beginning of the 20th century. I mean, in the beginning of the 20th century, only the richest could allow to travel, for instance, to Egypt. Now I see on the airport in Prague, in the hundreds of people, thousands, who are traveling in winter to Egypt for sun baths, for swimming, and so on. <coughs> uh, who, a hundred years ago, if you have a halfway wealthy and gay, you at least had a britchka to move about. Now, the, great, the number of people who have a car who can travel all around Europe is enormous. If you just look at the number of young people who went all through Europe or went to the United States and are still studying and already studying there, something which a hundred years ago only the descendants of the richest family you could allow that a student goes to Oxford or some other university. In reality, we achieved an enormous wealth. We don't accept, we protested, but we have if we come home, as a rule, uh, a flat which is warm, we have quite assured food, as a, and we are reasonably well and warmly dressed. Certainly, uh, you be, be, we are really freezing, what I saw still in my childhood. So, I mean, we have to realize this wealth is incredible, but this wealth brings for everybody else responsibility too which still we try to evitate. And I do think either we will have a Europe of responsibility or we will have no Europe at all. And then, yes, expect you uh, as a receptionist as a hotel of greater Europe. Thank you very much. <laughs>
ask all of you to join me in thanking our panelists for this extraordinary opening of our conference. And I also, after you have finished thanking them, I invite the next panel to come immediately to the stage so we can proceed with these uh, events and take up the issue of the uh, EU budget. So thank you very much.